put the slide deck or you uh, you can't hear me, just just let me know and I can uh, can speak up. Um, so my name is Eric uh, and I'm one of the PGY fives uh, in the Emerge program. And for today's grand rounds, we're going to be discussing cocaine. Uh, I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, we'll be focusing on cocaine associated chest pain specifically, and we'll discuss the pathophysiology and the workup of individuals presenting to the Emerge Department uh, with chest pain in the setting of recent cocaine use. Uh, I want to touch on some of the specific pitfalls of diagnostic testing in this setting uh, and how to think about safely discharging this, these patients from the Emerge Department because as, we go, as we'll uh, you know, see as we go through the presentation, there are some issues that you should be aware of. So in terms of the uh, disclosure, I have no disclosures and, and no conflicts of interest to declare. Here's the outline for today's talk. The overall management of cocaine-related emergencies is, is fairly straightforward and it's well covered in the Rosen's chapter. Um, so like I said, we're not gonna go into the nitty gritty of each individual organ system as it's affected by cocaine. Uh, and we're gonna focus specifically on cocaine-related uh, chest pain and MI since there's some interesting uh, literature which I think is relevant to us uh, as eMERGE docs. Um, so, but we'll cover some of the epidemiology and some of the pharmacology uh, and why you should care about this as a clinical entity. And then, like I said, hopefully come up with some uh, discharge criteria towards the end of the talk, which can help in your decision making. Uh, but first things first, we should, we should learn how to make. Uh, as with all recipes, I typically turn to, to Gordon Ramsay first. He made a documentary on how cocaine is produced, which he filmed uh, in Colombia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I wanted to show the video, but it's so dense with profanity that I didn't think I could use it. So instead, I kind of broke up uh, the process here. Uh, the first step is to collect this plant uh, here, which is the coca plant. Um, and it grows mostly in the Andean Amazonian region of South America. Uh, next, you and your buddies uh, throw on your favorite soccer jerseys and chop up all the leaves uh, into mulch using uh, this weed whacker here. Uh, following this, you sprinkle a light dusting of cement onto the chopped leaves. The calcium carbonate uh, contained within the cement aids in the extraction process, which I'll show you in a couple slides. The alkaline nature of the powder also helps break down the cell wall uh, of the coca plant, which is going to increase the overall yield. Uh, next, you use your bare hand, apparently, to splash some uh, sulfuric acid over the cement covered leaves and, and the acid plus the calcium carbonate uh, from the cement facilitate further mechanical degradation allowing the naturally occurring alkaloid uh, cocaine to be extracted. After this you add everything into a giant pot or in this case a, uh, a steel oil drum uh, and cover everything with kerosene here. The hydrocarbon acts as a solvent which is going to extract the cocaine uh, from the mixture that you see pictured here which is that mulch that they all chopped up. Finally a dash of battery acid uh, completes the extraction process. And since cocaine is, is water soluble, it's gonna layer out. It's then extracted by siphoning off from that hydrocarbon sludge that was produced in the previous slide. Uh, this liquid that you, you see coming out here contains the uh, cocaine in solution. So this uh, solution is then sequentially boiled down, leaving that white powder residue, which is cocaine. Uh, the product is then packaged and distributed around the world through a complex network of legal and illegal ports of entry. Um, so you can see it's produced here and kind of goes everywhere throughout the planet. Uh, the route into Canada here is represented by this thinly little white line uh, shown within this red circle. So I wanted to look into how much of a problem this little white line represents when it comes to cocaine use in Canada. Uh, this is some aggregate data from the Canadian Tobacco and Drug Survey. It's a yearly report on Canadian drug use uh, and they compile the report into these meta-analyses uh, from what I found every five years. Um, and as you can see, cocaine use uh, seems to be increasing uh, across nearly all demographics, uh, except thankfully the 15 to 19 year old uh, age group. Um, however, it is also important to remember that this is self-reported data, which suggests that it likely underestimates the scope of the problem, especially in this younger population, which is going to be, you know, understandably a little bit more hesitant to report cocaine use to an adult. 
when compared to the uh, rest of the world, or the so-called developed world, uh, Canada seems to be fairly middle of the pack when it comes to uh, cocaine consumption. You know, interestingly, our consumption exceeds some countries like Mexico here, which are closer geographically to the focus of cocaine production in Colombia. So clearly the, the distribution uh, this far north is not an issue for these drug traffickers. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is data based on that same survey that I showed you earlier. Uh, cocaine consistently ranks uh, as the third most popular substance used by Canadians. Uh, only alcohol and cannabis are more popular, which I thought was, was fairly surprising. I didn't expect it to be that prevalent. Um, this trend is seen across, again, most age groups, uh, with the exception of that 15 to 19 year old group. Uh, however, even in this age group, cocaine still ranks uh, in the top five. It's somewhat tied with ecstasy. Um, and when looking at the university age crowd here in this uh, uh, red box, uh, the rate is nearly triple that seen in other demographics. Um, so overall, the, you know, the too long don't read is uh, Canadians love cocaine and you're likely to see its effects uh, in the emergency department with some consistency, especially uh, when the students return uh, given this, uh, this rate of usage here. In terms of some of the basics, uh, so cocaine, cocaine comes in two widely available forms. Cocaine hydrochloride is the formulation that most people are familiar with based on pop culture. Uh, and this is that classic, you know, white powder that you see in like movies like Scarface and things like that. Uh, and, and this is the uh, formulation uh, that I showed you being produced earlier. Um, this form cannot be combusted. Uh, it is destroyed through pyrolysis and you would get no, uh, you know, the, none of the desirable uh, effects that uh, drug users are seeking when they uh, use cocaine. So instead it's either snorted or because it's highly soluble in water, it's dissolved and then injected uh, into uh, an intravenous site. Um, crack cocaine um, is what's pictured down here below. And this is basically the free base form of the cocaine salt. Uh, and that's made by slowly heating uh, this substance, cocaine uh, hydrochloride in the presence of baking soda. Uh, the resulting crystal is uh, much more stable um, at higher temperatures and it can survive combustion. Uh, so as a result, uh, this is the formulation that can be smoked uh, in a crack pipe uh, and it's significantly cheaper because the supply is cut with large quantities of baking soda. Um, this led to widespread addiction throughout the inner cities uh, in the 80s and 90s um, and was a major epidemic, uh, it still is a big problem. Um, both formulations uh, listed here result in basically the same biological and, and clinical effects, which we'll touch on in a couple slides. Uh, the pharmacokinetics are altered slightly in that the mode of ingestion is going to alter uh, the peak plasma concentration uh, and the kinetics of the cocaine once it does enter your system. So this is a, a breakdown of peak plasma concentrations of cocaine based on modality of consumption. Uh, you know, clearly IV direct is going to be uh, the most potent delivery mechanism resulting in the fastest and largest uh, peak plasma concentration. Uh, combustion and inhalation is represented by this uh, red line here. Uh, and as you can see, um, it's basically just as fast in terms of, of onset. Uh, the peak total concentration is somewhat lower uh, for the same given amount of cocaine because it obviously has to go through uh, several more steps before it reaches, reaches your bloodstream compared to a, an IV uh, injection. Um, the oral um, and intranasal routes, which are represented by the purple and green line here, uh, they're fairly similar. There's somewhat more nasal mucosa available for absorption uh, compared to the oral route. So the peak concentration is slightly higher, but effectively they're, they're pretty much identical. Once cocaine makes it into your bloodstream, these are the main metabolic pathways, uh, regardless of the delivery mechanism. So cocaine is predominantly metabolized by plasma cholinesterase, which produces a non-active uh, metabolite, uh, ecogonium methyl ester. Um, the hydrolysis of, of cocaine is uh, a little bit more interesting. About 40% of the uh, metabolism goes through this pathway. Uh, this results in um, uh, benzoyl um, uh, ecoganine, which is, uh, has a half-life of about 52 minutes, and this is the metabolite which is tested for in urine tox screens. Um, uh, via urine sample are going to be positive within about four hours of consumption, and they're going to remain positive for about eight days. 
so you know the clinical utility is questionable uh, based on those numbers, but that's kind of a discussion for for another talk. Um, Norcocaine results in the oxidation of the parent compound cocaine, and this accounts for a little bit less than 10% of the metabolism. Uh, this is important in that uh, norcocaine is an active metabolite, uh, which is going to um, simulate the effects of, of the parent compound cocaine. It rapidly cause, crosses the blood-brain barrier and produces similar clinical effects to cocaine and is going to potentiate cocaine's effect. Uh, cocaine's effects and prolong the uh, cocaine toxidrome. Um, finally, a small amount of the cocaine is excreted in the urine, basically unchanged. So um, once you know cocaine makes it into your system and goes to this metabolism, how does it actually work? Uh, and in short, cocaine acts as a reuptake inhibitor of biological amines. So uh, molecules like serotonin and then your uh, catecholamines, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Uh, clinically, this results in sustained elevated levels of catecholamines uh, in the synapse, which is going to result in your kind of classic hyperadrenergic state of cocaine toxicity. So on the uh, screen left here, you see the kind of normal physiologic process of catecholamine reuptake following synaptic transmission. So you have the presynaptic vesicle, which comes down here, releases its neurotransmitter, in this case, it's, it's dopamine. Dopamine binds uh, to its receptor, its downstream effect is initiated, and then it disengages, floats back up to the uh, reuptake transporter where it's internalized again, and then degraded into its constituent uh, monoamines. These are then recycled into new neurotransmitters and the, the cycle kind of continues. Uh, on the screen right here, you can see that cocaine is now uh, uh, represented by this little uh, yellow brick here. Uh, cocaine is now blocking that reuptake transporter again, for in this case, uh, dopamine, um, and is going to result in elevated levels of uh, a given catecholamine within the, the synapse. So it's important to remember that cocaine blocks this reuptake, not just for dopamine, it's just the one I'm showing you in this diagram. Um, it, it blocks it for all biological amines, uh, again, serotonin, uh, dopamine, epi, and norepi. Um, and they're all going to have slightly different but somewhat synergistic effects. Uh, so here's a, a breakdown of the specific reuptake blockade and the resulting uh, clinical effects in, in very broad terms, just so you get an idea of what we're talking about. Um, so serotonin and, and dopamine are going to uh, cause a lowering of your seizure threshold while facilitating addiction through modulation of different re reward pathways within the brain. Serotonin and dopamine also apparently play a role in, in some of the platelet aggregation issues that we're going to talk about uh, uh, in a couple slides as well. Epi and norepi, uh, you know, they have fairly predictable clinical effects based on what we know about these uh, molecules, and they're largely going to drive the sympathomimetic crisis, uh, which occurs in acute cocaine toxicity. This is a flowchart that's kind of ripped right out of uh, Gold Frank's representing the effects of biological amine reuptake inhibition. This is fairly uh, simplified, but it, it works well for framing uh, the discussion that we're going to have uh, on cocaine-related chest pain specifically. So we're kind of going to focus in on, on this aspect of, of what's going on here. So the, the clinical effects of, of cocaine are, you know, some of the big ones are listed here. Um, they're quite varied, and, and basically every organ system in the body is going to be uh, involved, particularly in the case of acute toxicity. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning of this talk, I want to focus on uh, this specific subset um, of, uh, of clinical manifestations and discuss chest pain and MI in the setting of cocaine use specifically. So, you know, we're not going to talk about uh, conduction delays or, or levomisole induced vasculitis or any of the CNS manifestations or how copaethylene, uh, you know, uh, potentiates the effects of cocaine. Um, you know, really you could do a entire talk on any one given organ system and how it's affected uh, uh, by cocaine. So uh, like I said, I just want to focus what's uh, outlined here in red. And the key distinction I want to make uh, on this slide is that while most of these issues you see listed here are a consequence of acute overdose and toxicity, uh, the cardiovascular issues, uh, again, those ones I have listed there in the red box, uh, they're known to occur during recreational use without other signs of systemic toxicity. So um, it's something that you need to be primed for and something that you need to be thinking about even in someone who's not 
overtly cocaine toxic. Um, and when I say cocaine use, I, I mean a spectrum from recreational use with minimal to mild symptoms, if any, uh, all the way to your acutely toxic hyperthermic uh, patient with conduction abnormalities. So again, focusing in on, on these aspects of, of the uh, cocaine um, toxicity, uh, cocaine is the most commonly abused drug in patients uh, presenting to the emergency department with chest pain. The uh, extent and severity of underlying coronary artery disease in this subgroup of patients has not been well defined, although it's been fairly well established that cocaine is a significant risk factor for coronary artery disease uh, and MI. Um, cocaine causes myocardial infarction through four primary mechanisms, which I have list listed there on the chart. Uh, so first, you're going to have increased myocardial oxygen demand, uh, and this is largely due to the sympathomimetic surge, your increased heart rate, blood pressure, and contractility. The heart muscle is just working harder, so it needs more, more supply, uh, oxygen supply. Um, this is an issue, especially because cocaine simultaneously decreases the oxygen supply through vasoconstriction of the coronary arteries. Um, this, when combined with uh, induction of a prothrombotic state uh, through the stimulation of platelet activation, and there's an alteration that occurs between the balance of procoagulant and anticoagulant factors within the body, um, all leads to increased risk for uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, and then on top of all of this, there's uh, accelerated atherosclerosis, which occurs uh, through cocaine use. And this is thought to be due to direct endovascular toxicity. And this is fairly well established through numerous autopsy studies. Um, and an issue we'll talk about uh, throughout this, uh, this talk is that uh, these patients tend to be young, so people tend to not be primed to think of them in terms of uh, high risk for coronary artery disease because they could be you know, 30 years old. But in reality, their, their coronary vasculature is aged significantly through uh, repetitive cocaine use. Um, and, and this was a bit of a startling statistic that I found. 25% of all non-fatal myocardial infarctions in the 18 to 45-year-old age group are directly attributable to cocaine use. Um, and again, cocaine use in this setting, it runs the spectrum from infrequent recreational use to acute toxicity. So the important thing to remember is that this process is occurring in, in all patients who use cocaine, not just the ones who are presenting to the emergency department in extremis. Here's a, uh, um, a diagram representing the four mechanisms, which we basically just talked about uh, on the last slide, just in a more of a... Um, kind of schematic representation. I'll use this diagram later on when we're discussing working these patients up as well. But the thing I want you to take away from, from this slide is that this is a dynamic process. Um, so the, um, you know, the level of vasospasm, the amount of platelet aggregation, the sympathomimetic uh, surge, hypertension, tachycardia, these factors are all in a constant state of flux. Uh, and these constant fluctuations in cardiac blood flow, demand, and this kind of you know, relative fixed lesion uh, caused by platelet aggregation and underlying atherosclerosis, um, these are the reasons why the diagnostic workup for chest pain in the setting of cocaine is hampered by multiple diagnostic pitfalls, which we're going to discuss in a few slides. So just remember that this is dynamic and it's changing uh, rapidly uh, in patients who use cocaine. So uh, this, I just want to change gears here for a second and introduce a case. Um, this was a guy that I saw a couple months ago, which uh, initially got me thinking about this as a topic for Grand Rounds. It wasn't actually, uh, you know, Rick James himself, but um, it's uh, a bit difficult over Zoom to have some participation, but I just wanted you guys to, to think about this case and, and what you would do if you were working, you know, let's say a busy night shift at Vic and, and this guy came in. Um, so, you know, he's 36 years old. He's got some maybe atypical kind of ischemic symptoms. Uh, started about uh, 40 minutes ago after snorting some cocaine. Uh, the pain is kind of waxing and waning. It's largely resolved at this point in time, and he feels pretty good, kind of wants to go home. He's got no other medical issues going on. And when you go and see him, his exam is unremarkable. All the investigations you do look good. You know, you even repeated his ECG, and it looks fine or it's not changing at least. And his tropes are maybe a little bit elevated, but they're fairly stable and not all that striking. So just want you to think, what would you do with this patient? Would you discharge them? Uh, you know, if so, what kind of return instructions would you give them? Would you observe them? If so, for how long? Would you do any other testing? And if so, what would it be? And if you're gonna call cardiology, what would you be calling them for?
So, you know, with respect to the disposition options, uh, cocaine related chest pain falls into three main categories, as do nearly all presentations to the emergency department. So you're either going to come into hospital um, uh, through an admission, you're going to go home, or you're going to go to the morgue. Uh, and usually the sicker the patient, you know, because they're getting admitted, it's hard to you know push back a, a hypotensive intubated patient like that person's coming into hospital, right? Um, and, and you know more often the people that we worry about are, are is this group is the people that we're sending home. So I want to spend some time specifically talking about uh, the evidence surrounding chest pain as it pertains to cocaine abuse and the workup, risk stratification, and uh, discharge criteria. Uh, for this patient population. So we'll review some of the ways that, you know, based on the literature, you can risk stratify them, and hopefully we'll come up with some objective criteria that will, will make you feel a little bit better about sending some of these patients home, or conversely, getting cardiology involved uh, if, if you're uh, having concerns. So when it, uh, when it comes to, to chest pain, obviously it's a, it's a fairly non-specific presentation to the eMERGE department. Um, it's quite common, and so the workup can be quite broad, but there are some, some common themes that you'd see in most workups. Uh, you know, most patients in the emergency department uh, with chest pain, they're going to be getting an ECG, maybe a, a repeat ECG, uh, maybe a chest x-ray, uh, and depending on, on the, um, their, their risk, some of them will be getting cardiac biomarker testing with potentially a repeat there as well. So what I want to do is kind of break up the components uh, of this workup uh, and talk about the reliability of these investigations as they pertain to patients who have abused cocaine uh, presenting to the emergency department with chest pain. So as all things eMERGE related, first we, we need to go to our Bible and see what Rosens has to say on the matter. Um, the, the chapter on cocaine use is, is it, it's good, it's quite large, and it talks a, a lot about those multi-system issues that I uh, brought up uh, towards the beginning of this talk. But when it comes to cocaine-induced chest pain specifically, uh, Rosen is somewhat scant on the difference between cocaine and non-cocaine-related chest pain. Um, and this is a quote that I kind of clipped directly out of uh, uh, the chapter. So they say that we recommend that patients with cocaine use be evaluated for chest pain in a similar fashion to that for patients without cocaine use. And by the end of this grand rounds, uh, you know, I hope to convince you that these patients shouldn't be treated exactly the same as non-cocaine uh, users. And like I said, while many of the diagnostic tests that you're going to order are the same, it's the interpretation of these tests that needs to be reconsidered in, in cocaine use specifically. And to, to frame this discussion, I want to show you guys some statistics regarding myocardial infarction miss rates in the eMERGE department. Um, so first, the miss rate of uh, myocardial infarction in cocaine users is at least triple the rate of all comers to the eMERGE department with chest pain. So, you know, it, you have about a 2 to 4% chance of missing an MI in someone who walks in with chest pain. That risk goes up to 15 and by some estimates, 25% uh, in patients who are using cocaine. This third point here is, is somewhat contentious depending on which sources you look at in the literature. Uh, from what I saw, I tried to pick a, an estimate here of uh, five to nine percent, which was somewhat middle of the pack and based on the larger sample sizes in the studies that I found. Uh, but still, uh, even, even if you take the lower number, a five percent chance of uh, someone having an acute myocardial infarction in any given patient population would be concerning it and should prime you to be thinking about a particular uh, ischemic etiology in patients with chest pain. Um, so obviously it's, it, they're at a very high risk. Um, and cocaine alone increases your risk of having an MI by about 24 fold. This patient population also has a very high rate of concomitant cigarette smoking. So this demographic you know, just by virtue of their lifestyle is incredibly high risk for MI. Um, and obviously we're, we are doctors, we're not lawyers, um, but it is important to remember that missed MIs represent the single largest complaint resulting in uh, settlement dollars paid out uh, in North America. So that's just a, a little friendly reminder from the CMPA. Um, you know, missed MIs are such a problem that there, there's tons of research uh, and publications aimed at trying to understand and mitigate the factors which result in missed MIs in the eMERGE department. So this is some eMERGE-based literature from 2009, and the stats that I showed you on the previous page were, were derived from this study as well. Uh, the authors were attempting to describe how uh, 
part of the uh, part of the paper was attempting to describe how an atypical presentation to the emergency department results in a higher miss rate for MIs. And as you can see, they have an entire little subsection on this chart here, which is dedicated specifically to cocaine-related chest pain and the factors which obscure accurate diagnosis uh, of MI in this patient population. So first off, the, uh, the presentation and history regarding uh, you know, chest pain and ischemic symptoms in cocaine users is atypical from the start. These patients tend to be young with few cardiovascular risk factors, um, and this likely biases a lot of providers to underestimate the likelihood of ACS uh, in this patient population from the start. But like I said, you got to remember that their coronary vasculature is prematurely aged, and, and it, it's not going to match their chronological age. Um, so if you see a 30-year-old who's been using cocaine for 10 years, you can expect their coronary arteries to, to look much older. Um, and, you know, the authors also note a decreased sensitivity of ECG in the setting of cocaine use. Uh, they reference another study here, which, uh, which found that 15% um, of cocaine-related MIs were incorrectly discharged from the ED while actively having an MI based on a non-diagnostic uh, ECG, um, which is obviously quite striking. And that's that, that point here. And, and we'll unpack this study and, and some of the other issues around ECGs in a couple slides. Um, uh, secondarily, they also talk about the la lack of risk stratification tools in this, in this patient population as a large issue, since all of the existing risk, risk calculation tools for chest pain uh, don't account for cocaine use. Uh, and we're going to go into some of these points in more detail. We'll start off with the, um, the history and the physical here. So this was a large study which was attempting to quantify some of the issues in uh, the cardiac workup of cocaine-related chest pain. So they had uh, 246 cocaine users with chest pain who were included. 14 of them went on to eventually be diagnosed with an MI, which is about 6% fitting with that existing literature that I showed you previously. Uh, and the median age for those with an MI was only 33 years old uh, in this study. And their symptoms, again, were less common. Uh, there was less commonly the classic kind of cardiac ischemic symptoms um, and more commonly, these atypical presentations. 40% um, of these patients, uh, that is the 14 patients who had an MI, 40% of them had their MI within 60 minutes of cocaine use. However, there were several uh, patients who developed symptoms days after uh, using cocaine. That's probably due to the pro-thrombotic uh, uh, issues that I talked about earlier. Um, so the, the young age plus the, the risk of the uh, sorry, the lack of risk stratification factors likely plays a big role in, in underdiagnosing these patients because physicians will have a lower clinical suspicion just walking into the room. And I remember at Fowler, I, I remember seeing a patient who was 28 years old who had two stents as a result of cocaine use. And obviously that, that's anecdotal, but the point is you need to maintain a high index of suspicion in anyone presenting with any kind of remotely sounding ischemic symptoms in the setting of cocaine use. And additionally, there was no difference in the, the route, the length, or the frequency of cocaine use in those who infarcted. And that's based off an N of 14, again, but uh, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, and lastly, uh, this study found that no patient's diagnosis uh, was able to be made off the ECG. And that's even in retrospect. So they went back and looked at the, the ECGs of those 14 patients who infarcted um, to see if they could you know, determine whether or not they met uh, criteria based off their ECG alone, and none of them did. Uh, and this is, this is the reason why. Um, the main issue with ECGs in this setting uh, of cocaine use is the severely reduced sensitivity for the dis detection of ischemia. So in non-cocaine users, the sensitivity is, is quite good, you know, somewhere in the kind of 80% range, range. And clearly this is going to be based somewhat off the skill of the practitioner in ECG interpretation. But you know, assessing the ST segment for um, you know, depression or elevation is fairly routine and, and something that most physicians should be fairly well versed in, especially in the eMERGE setting. Um, but once you add cocaine into the mix, the sensitivity is reduced by nearly 50% by some estimates. Um, the other issue is that um, in non-cocaine users, serial ECGs will increase your sensitivity. So if you do two or three uh, ECGs, uh, your sensitivity for the, the detection of ischemia in a non-cocaine user, uh, that starts approaching the greater than 95% range. Um, however, this same trend doesn't hold true in cocaine users, and that, that uh, sensitivity of low 30% holds true uh, even with multiple ECGs 
Um, so the point here is that normal, a normal ECG or, or even a non-diagnostic ECG shouldn't be all that reassuring to you uh, in a cocaine user who's presenting with uh, chest pain or any kind of ischemic symptoms, especially if they're remaining symptomatic. Um, and so why does the ECG perform so poorly in this setting? And the main reason uh, based on this study, which was published in circulation, seems to be the very high rate of baseline abnormal ECGs in, in this population. So of those 246 ECGs uh, from the patients with cocaine-induced chest pain, this is how the interpretation broke down. Um, they found that the majority of this population, uh, up to 84% of them, uh, had a baseline abnormal ECG. Uh, and as you can see, many of these abnormalities reduce the diagnostic accuracy when you're specifically trying to assess the SD segment for ischemic changes. So things like benign early repoll, um, you know, LVH and uh, left bundles are gonna contribute to a lower sensitivity uh, for ECG in the detection of ischemic changes in anyone, uh, not only cocaine users, but when you combine the fact that lots of them have these pre-existing issues, it further decreases the sensitivity even further. Um, you know, additionally, criteria that you would use to assess for ischemia, uh, ischemia in the setting of some of these pre-existing abnormalities, you know, let's say you know, Scarposa criteria and left bundle, for example, none of them have been validated in the setting of cocaine use. So if these criteria are inappropriately applied, uh, they may falsely reassure the treating physician uh, if they're not aware of this as a pitfall. Uh, like I said, um, so only 14% of them had normal ECGs uh, uh, at their presenting uh, time to the eMERGE department. And this is also part of the reason why serial ECGs uh, are less effective um, and less uh, able to increase the sensitivity for the detection of ischemia. The high rate of abnormal findings are likely chronic in this patient population, um, and they're likely to be present on old ECGs and remain fixed between serial exams in the ED. Because like I said, you don't need to be cocaine toxic to manifest these changes. Uh, this is a function of just sustained cocaine use uh, throughout life. So if you remember from that, uh, that previous study I showed you, um, uh, the one with all the statistics, they, they reference uh, another study which shows that, or found that 15% of cocaine-related MIs were incorrectly discharged from the ED based on a non-diagnostic ECG. Um, and some of those authors then went back and tried to discern what was driving the misinterpretation of ECGs in the setting of uh, cocaine use. And this is what they produced. So the, the takeaway points are, basically don't assume that benign early repolarization is the cause of a sus suspicious looking ST segment simply because the patient is young. Uh, and remember that the median age for MI in the other study that I showed you was only 33 years old. Uh, second, you can apply things like Scarbosa criteria to these patients um, since none of those criteria have been validated in the setting of cocaine use. And lastly, don't be falsely reassured by a non-diagnostic ECG. So the sensitivity is quite poor, um, especially if the patient remains symptomatic, you need to move on to further testing. So if the ECG is unreliable, how do cardiac biomarkers compare between cocaine use and uh, uh, cocaine users and non-cocaine users? Um, you know, creatinine uh, kinase or CK is, is of questionable relevance regardless uh, of whether or not cocaine is on board. Uh, but in the setting of cocaine use, it's especially unreliable. These patients are often agitated, perhaps a bit hyperthermic. So the rate of incidental CK elevation is going to be quite high. Um, I'm sure cardiology is going to want it regardless, but just don't hang your hat on it. Uh, not that many of us do anyways, I think. Um, you know, thankfully, troponin remains sensitive and specific at a rate similar to that seen in non-cocaine users. Uh, but there are several pitfalls that you should be aware of uh, when it comes to interpreting a, a, an elevated troponin uh, in someone who's abusing cocaine. Um, and so I have this diagram up here again so we can, we can talk about uh, some of these issues. And, and firstly, uh, the point I wanna make here is that uh, based off the poor performance of an ECG, I think it's reasonable to get a trope on anyone presenting with ischemic symptoms in the setting of cocaine use regardless of their age. Uh, second, the degree of ischemia does not correlate well with the magnitude of the trope rise. So even minimal trope bumps uh, should have you concerned uh, in this setting. And remember this diagram, this process of you know, spasm, uh, atherosclerosis, platelet aggregation, and the adrenergic surge are all going to be in this constant state of flux. And that classic you know, rise, peak, and then fall of cardiac biomarkers was initially derived in non-cocaine users with fixed coronary lesions. So 
really that, that mental model of, of how the trope should respond can't be applied in this population because they don't have that same fixed lesion. They're more in a, in a state of flux. Um, and, and as a result uh, of the same, uh, uh, the same kind of uh, issue, the, the standard two tropes, three hours apart, may not be sufficient in this patient population to capture all uh, ischemic events. Um, and again, a common pit pitfall here was, again, attributing ischemic findings like a very small trope bump uh, to trivial etiologies like a sympathomimetic agitation, simply because the patient was young. Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that the, the biochemical response to ischemia in cocaine users is subtle. It's less impressive uh, than non-cocaine users, and it's not going to follow the same um, um, peak and, and fall that you would see uh, in tropes typically. So, you know, I hope I've convinced you that while it's true that cocaine-related chest pain patients undergo the same tests as non-cocaine users, the interpretation of these investigations needs to, needs to be considered in the setting of cocaine use specifically and not compared to the results that you would expect from the cardiac work of a non-cocaine user. Um, so how should you interpret the elevated troponin uh, in these patients? The Rosen's chapter um, goes on to make the following statement uh, one paragraph later with really no follow-up explanation. Uh, and they state that uh, you know, most patients presenting with troponin elevation and chest pain after cocaine use had angiographically proven obstructive coronary artery disease, uh, often of a single vessel, but almost 20% have normal angiography. Um, which I thought was a bit of a strange statement. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you, if you crunch those numbers, uh, does that mean that 80% of these patients with cocaine induced chest pain and a trope rise have obstructive coronary artery disease? So 80% of these guys need a stent, uh, which sounded like a, a very high number to me. So I went and looked at the source uh, that the Rosen's uh, chapter lists for that specific point. And this is the original study that they mentioned. Um, this was a study which was published a, a couple of years ago now, uh, done out of D Detroit, I think, and they enrolled 97 consecutive patients presenting to their eMERGE department with chest pain in the setting of recent cocaine use. Um, of the 97 patients that they had, 66 uh, patients went on to have uh, angiography. Um, and while the study does have its issues, you know, chiefly it's got a very small kind of homogeneous sample population from a single center, they did indeed find that 82% uh, of patients presenting with cocaine-induced chest pain uh, and an elevated troponin had obstructive coronary artery disease. And the majority of them went on to, to require a stent, actually. 10% of them had complete occlusions. Uh, and additionally, they found the same trend in atypical presentation and unreliable non-diagnostic ECG findings in this population. They also make note that the trope rise would, was modest in most of these patients. They didn't specifically state what it was, but it wasn't the same, you know, impressive trope uh, elevation that you would see with a, a regular STEMI. Um, interestingly, after the angiography, angiography was performed uh, in these patients, the researchers then went back to the presenting ECGs and tried to interpret them retrospectively, you know, with angiographic evidence uh, of uh, their coronary lesion they tried to then look at the ECGs. And interestingly, they found that none of the presenting ECGs were correlated with the angiographic location or the severity of the obstruction. So again, even more evidence not to trust an ECG in this setting. So what are you supposed to do with all of this information? Um, you know, clearly not everyone is gonna be consulted to cardiology. And how can you decide who needs further workup, who needs an admission, and who can go home? Um, this uh, article was published in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. It's really the only thing I came across citing specific uh, observation and discharge criteria for cocaine-induced chest pain. Now, these, thing, these points are, are fairly intuitive, and we'll unpack some of them. And as most clinical decision tools, they're just trying to mimic the, you know, the gestalt of a reasonable physician. Um, so it's fairly straightforward and things that probably most of us are doing anyways uh, in the setting of any kind of chest pain. Maybe not to the same extent that's listed here, but we'll talk about why they needed to do that. Um, the only interventions uh, administered during this observation period were uh, aspirin, nitro, and benzos for uh, agitation uh, from cocaine. So no analgesia was given uh, to any of these patients, um, you know, for fear of masking the cardiac, uh, uh, ongoing cardiac pain. Um, so basically, if you want to discharge a cocaine user safely from the eMERGE department based on this study, you need to observe them for 9 to 12 hours uh, before they can be safely discharged 
while on telemetry in the ED, and they need a normal troponin at four time points, zero, three, six, and nine hours, which seems a little bit excessive, uh, and serial ECGs with no significant changes, no recurrence of their uh, ischemic symptoms, and no cardiac arrhythmias at any point in time, uh, which they didn't define all that well. Um, and they didn't define the, the kind of the significant changes of the ECGs all that well either. But um, in any case, I think the length of observation may be an issue uh, for some people, particularly in a busy eMERGE department. Um, but when you consider that these patients are likely going to wait a couple hours at least before seeing the MD because they're not going to have striking troponins, they're not going to have striking ECGs, I, I don't think it's that unreasonable, especially if your clinical suspicion is high, to observe them for a period of time. And there's lots of things that we set arbitrary observation periods for in the MERS department without any evidence, especially in talks where, you know, that kind of six to eight hours seems to be this magic number uh, when it comes to observation uh, with very little in the way of actual evidence to support it. These criteria are at least validated and something objective to base your disposition on uh, in the setting of highly insensitive and subtle diagnostic testing results, chiefly the ECG and your troponin. Um, so, in, the, in this study, they had 344 patients uh, who met these specific criteria, um, and, and all of these patients uh, at 30 days were still alive after being discharged from the eMERGE department. Uh, four patients went on to sustain a non-fatal MI, but these were four people who continued to use cocaine after being discharged. Um, so clearly, you know, you can't change people's lifestyle outside the hospital. Um, and in this study, anyone who didn't meet these, uh, these specific criteria was then consulted to cardiology uh, for further workup um, or admission, depending on, on, uh, on the severity of their clinical symptoms. So how do you kind of interpret this and, and, and put this all together? This is a flowchart, uh, you know, that I made representing the workup pathway, as I understand it, based on the literature that, you know, I've reviewed for this Grand Rounds. And obviously, this is not set in stone. It's open to interpretation and discussion, but it's just something to, to frame. Uh, I think it's a useful framework to, to talk about these patients because they're a little more subtle, a little bit more difficult than you would initially anticipate, uh, just based on, on what we know about cocaine. Um, you know, as mentioned, I think all of these patients should be getting troponins, regardless of their age. Um, the ECG is just not sensitive enough and it's just not a good enough test to use as a screen. Um, if any of the, you know, in the, in the rare instance that the troponin or the ECG is diagnostic, then great, these patients can be shipped off to cardiology uh, and your disposition is set. Um, if not, if you don't have a diagnostic or in the rare case that you have a normal ECG in this setting, um, then I think this is when the period of observation comes into play, especially if your patient is still symptomatic. Um, now, I don't know what the uptake is of the literature on the cardiology side uh, for this type of thing, but in the New England study, like I mentioned, everyone who failed this observation period then went to cardiology and went on to have either stress testing or angiography. Um, so I, I think it's reasonable to do the same. And if, if, you, if you don't feel good about sending a patient home and they're not meeting these criteria, then I think it's reasonable to call cardiology. Um, again, especially if they remain symptomatic and you don't have an alternate cause uh, for their ongoing symptoms. Uh, and you know, when you're consulting cardiology, uh, you're likely going to be dealing with the off-service R2 overnight. So I think just keep that in mind if you're getting pushback uh, when you're having this type of discussion with them. Um, and obviously, if they pass, then, then you can discharge them home and feel pretty good about it that they're not going to have a significant cardiac event, at least within 30 days. So in terms of... Uh, you know, a summary for what we've talked about today. Uh, the main point of this talk is that cocaine is bad. You shouldn't do it. Uh, the ECG is unfortunately uh, quite unreliable in the setting of cocaine use. The rate of MI is highest in the first hour, but I wouldn't hang my hat on that because there was cases of symptom onset days after uh, cocaine uh, use. Uh, like I said, I think all of these patients should be getting troponins. Any trope rise, uh, even if it's modest or mild, and even if it's not changing all that much, it should prompt further investigations, even if it's minimal, based on the evidence that I reviewed. Um, and again, this, this period of observation, somewhere between nine and 12 hours, is not unreasonable when you think about some of the other observation periods we observe and emerge. Um, I would have a low threshold for contacting cardiology in these patients, even if it's just to arrange closer follow-up or outpatient testing. Um, and I think at minimum, most of these patients have a stress test reasonably quickly, given the very high rate of um, significant coronary artery disease. 
I don't think it's reasonable to do, be doing angiography on all of these patients just because they have cocaine use and a minor trope bump. Um, but I think the, a prompt stress test is a, is a nice middle ground to try and navigate who then would need an angiography and who wouldn't. Um, and the main takeaway point here is that myocardial infarction in the setting of cocaine use is historically, electrographically, and biochemically very subtle. It's something that you need to have a high index of suspicion for um, and something that you need to be thinking of uh, when you see this pati these patients uh, from the get-go. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Eric, it's John. Hi. Hi. Great talk. Uh, really uh, uh, highlights the difficulties in dealing with these patients. Thank you. Um, I do have one uh, question for you related to that last paper that you, uh, you referenced. Um, do you know if they were using a standard troponin or if it was high sensitivity? Because obviously that would potentially decrease the amount of time somewhat that you would you know, have to monitor the patients. Yeah, they used the high sensitivity troponin I. Uh, in okay. that paper. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I think it's probably a little bit overkill to do four. Um, but again, in, in the setting of these very minor trope bumps, you can see why they chose to do it. I think they just wanted to, to make sure that they had uh, uh, discharge criteria which were safe uh, rather than effective in terms of moving people out of the emergency department. So I think there's maybe a little bit of play in our center for, for repeating it four times. Um, you know, maybe three is reasonable or even two at six hours apart, something like that, if they're, if they're stable. Um, but yeah, it was the, the high sensitivity troponin that they used. Okay. And the only other comment I had was when you were talking about, uh, um, you know, potentially some of these patients will have waited several hours in, in the waiting room because they, uh, you know, they have normal ECGs. Um, you know, perhaps that's actually something we should, uh, sort of try to educate the nurses about in terms of, you know, patients who have experienced chest pain while taking or shortly after taking cocaine, uh, if they get that history at the front, that that should be part of the, uh, hey, doc, can you take a look at this ECG? Um, you know, we don't always get much of a history. It's usually, if we ask for it, the age um, and, and the ECG. Um, but this would be something to certainly to highlight so that those patients aren't put into a, a long queue in the waiting room. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. Like I said, yeah, like a lot of these patients, you'll be, you'll be seeing them like, you know, in chairs at Vic and they've been waiting like four or five hours. Right. So I think that's fantastic uh, idea to, to educate the nurses on it. Maybe we can build a new emerge department. So we have. Better yeah. Flow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Hey, Eric, it's Chantal Forrestal. Hey, um, hey, Chantal. Just want to say this is an awesome presentation. Your slides were like super organized, really visually appealing. It was great. I'm actually hoping you could send out a copy of your slides because I feel like when I call cardiology about someone with cocaine use and some really subtle ECG changes that are nonspecific and a trope of 15, I'm going to get a lot of eye rolls. So yeah. um, I would very much like to have these kind of on my phone is something I could reference before calling. So I have a little bit more in my armory when I have a chat with them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'd be happy to send it out. And like I said, like, you know, you're probably talking to the R2 off service, right? Who just doesn't want to see another consult. So, you know, this might be one of those cases where you, you escalate to the, to the fellow or even the staff, if you're really worried uh, about the patient, but yeah, I'm happy to send this out so you can, uh, you can throw some literature in their face. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, No problem. Anybody else, any other questions? Okay, great, well, thanks guys. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric.